So we're going to get started. Uh, welcome, I'm Glenn Cohen. I'm on the faculty here, and I'm also uh, the co-director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy and Biotechnology. Uh, and I'm also a former Peter Hutt student. Actually, I'm still a Peter Hutt student, right? I don't think you ever stop being a Peter Hutt student, once a student. Uh, but it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today uh, for a really fantastic event. We couldn't be more excited. And I'm going to turn uh, it over to our Master of Ceremonies, Dean Martha Minow. Thank you, Glenn. This is so great. In this minute, I get to introduce Glenn. I love this uh, round robin. This is uh, a complete delight to have the opportunity to honor one of my heroes. Uh, Peter Hutt uh, is the force of nature who has made food and drug law one of the hottest subjects anywhere, but especially here at Harvard Law School. It was once said, in fact, by Gandhi that a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. I know this is true, and I also know that Peter can do it by himself. <laughs> uh, truly, the role that Peter has played in the country, in the field, is exceptional. But it's also our great joy to celebrate the role that he has played here at Harvard Law School. So. Um, we are celebrating the first 20 years of Peter's uh, teaching here. I look forward to uh, celebrating the second 20 years sometime in the future. I'm going to briefly say some things about Peter so that he gets fully embarrassed. Um, and then we'll turn to uh, some others uh, for comments. Um, and we will give Peter a chance for a rebuttal because um, he's entitled. So. Um, it, it is certainly the case that uh, the law firm Covington and Burling is known for many, many fields. Its regulatory expertise is probably prime among them. I was lucky enough to be a summer associate there. And, uh, and so I got to see Peter's work uh, firsthand. His law practice uh, there uh, has uh, been at the firm since 1960, except for when he was in the government, when he was chief counsel for the Food and Drug Administration between 71 and 75. What's most amazing to me is how broad and varied his practice is. Uh, it runs the whole range from uh, everything regulated by the FDA, which turns out to be lots of things that are foods and some things that are drugs and some things that we don't know what they are. Um, and, and in fact, his role in drafting the medical device amendments um, indicates how burgeoning the field is. But as is always true, Peter's ahead of the game. So that was 1976, before most people people had ever even heard of the category. The same way that his fascination with food occurred long before the Food, food Law Student Association became the fastest growing student organization here at Harvard. Um, his role in the Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Science um, has continued since 1971. He's been a working, uh, a member of the Working Group on Innovation and Drug Development and Evaluation for President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. I'm trying to tell the people who know him very well things you don't know. Um, but his service on the whole range of scientific and advisory boards uh, as well as advising uh, venture funds, as well as advising uh, companies, as well as litigating pro bono cases for the homeless alcoholics and drug addicts, um, is, is simply unparalleled. And that is why we're not surprised that he has been recognized as among the best lawyers in America, 2013 FDA Lawyer of the Year for Washington, D.C., the uh, Washingtonian Magazine, one of Washington's best lawyers, period, out of 40,000 lawyers, and one of the most, uh, one of the 100 most influential people. I can go on and on and on. It is true that one phrase that I love uh, hearing uh, used to describe Peter is the dean of the food and drug bar, because that makes us co-deans. <laughs> so I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also another phrase that I've also heard, I don't know if you like this one, Peter, is ever ready bunny. Because your energy, <laughs> your energy is unparalleled and we are just thrilled to be able to celebrate you as we talk with some people you have influenced um, about the past, present, and future of food and drug law, um, which in no small way uh, features you. Um, I, his teaching here, um, I just want to say one more thing. Uh, besides teaching a stellar course, Peter has inspired people to write papers that get published that change the field. People has, uh, Peter has inspired people 
who are here on this panel, and they represent a larger group um, that really, I think, represents uh, an extraordinary contribution to the field, the people who now make up the field so you don't have to do it alone. Um, and therefore, it is uh, my great pleasure to turn back to Glenn Cohen, uh, who is assistant professor here and is the co-director of our Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics, where he makes all kinds of great, great things happen, including today's event. And he is a former student of Peter's, and his paper on pediatric drug development was published in the Food and Drug Law Journal in 2003. Glenn. Thank you, Dean, and thank you, Peter. As that'll be a, a phrase many of us, I think, will utter today is thank you, Peter. Uh, but I want to start, even though this is the 20-year celebration that we're doing, I want to put you back in the way back machine. You know, do, 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 do the flashback. And the flashback will take you back. Act one, I've entitled Humble Beginnings. Now, this is from the journal of uh, Peter Hutt, because, you know, of course, Peter being Peter, uh, decided to write up uh, a day-by-day -day account of his first year at Harvard Law School. And the, the account, which is published in the Journal of Legal Education, begins on Tuesday, December 28th, 1993. Of course, only Peter would come to Harvard Law School between Christmas Day and New Year's in order to get ready to teach the food and drug law. But I'm going to quote from the journals of Peter Hutt to begin with. Okay, and I quote, I'm not going to be able to do it in that loud, booming voice from Buffalo <laughs> that is uh, Peter's trademark. So I'll just use my quieter voice. My entire first day of Harvard Law School was occupied by unpacking my boxes, rearranging the office, 309 Griswold Hall, because of course we should all know exactly where his office was for posterity, and attempting to locate supplies. I discovered that there were no file drawers reserved for visiting teachers. All the materials I had brought had to remain in their boxes. There appeared to be no particular source of supplies, and I found that most of the items one takes for granted in a large law firm were evidently not available. <laughs> I considered myself fortunate to have included a box with several legal pads, file folders, and pens and pencils just before I left Washington. When I went searching in the outer office area for what I thought would be something as simple as scotch tape and could find none, one of the faculty came to my rescue. When he later found me looking for a pencil sharpener, he explained, with obvious humor, that at Harvard Law School, the professors work only in ink. It took me 20 minutes to locate a pencil sharpener in the office of the registrar. Peter, I've, I've, I've brought you know, some ink with you, a pen here, in case you run out. But from this very humble beginning has become a legacy, and really a legacy of teaching, of scholarship, uh, of mentorship that I'll just tell you a little bit about. And in the last few minutes, I'll say a bit about where I think uh, the future of the field is going, and some great conversations that Peter and I have had over the years about the future direction. So I will tell you that as a teacher, I use things that I saw Peter do teaching my class in food and drug law in 2002 repeatedly. One of my favorite techniques that I've copied from Peter, and they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, Peter, so I hope you'll agree, uh, is the notion of basically trying to connect our students in a very personal way to what we teach. Uh, so on the first day, Peter, unbeknownst to us, asked us all for our CVs or a page description of what we do. And in the course of uh, the class, he will drop little hints for everybody else to say, well, Glenn, you know, you studied bioethics as a student, so of course you're going to have a, a strong input on this. Or, you know, you lived in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Do you know what they make in Hershey, Pennsylvania, <laughs> right? So again, I teach civil procedure. I have to stretch a little bit more to find these kinds of connections. But one of the most wonderful things Peter does, it's also a way of humbly bragging about the students and getting students to know things about them, each other that ordinarily wouldn't come up in conversation. Something else I've cribbed from Peter is the joy of having debates, of making students take positions on thing and vociferously defending that. Just about every day in his food and drug law class, there is a topic up for debate, and as the field has grown and the field has changed, so has the topics. And one more way in which Peter's teaching methods were way above, ahead of their time is his recognition of the importance of simulations, right? So a good two or three days of the food and drug law class is given uh, to the role of students thinking of themselves as a startup company in the drug uh, and device space. And
And basically, we spend two or three days in a simulation to think about all the things one needs to do uh, from the beginning to getting a, a product to be clear. And this is a kind of uh, teaching method that the Carnegie Report has endorsed and that now much more, more widely spread in the law school in our program, uh, uh, our problem solving workshop course, our program on negotiation, the importance of role play. And each of these are about a visceral kind of experience, connecting students not just to the cases, and there are cases in Peter's classes, but the cases are really secondary. What matters is understanding the industry. What matters is understanding uh, the stakes. And what matters for Peter, and something else I've tried to copy, is the humor and generosity and investment in his students that characterize every day of his time at Harvard Law School. I see the light go on in the Lewis Hall classroom where he is early in the morning, and it doesn't go off till late at night. And the only times when he's not there is when he's taking students to lunch or dinner on a daily basis. Uh, and he loves it. I have to say, he thinks of this as his vacation. I can only imagine how hard he works at Covington, to be honest. So that's Peter in the classroom, my experience of Peter in the classroom. Second is the notion of Peter as a mentor. So uh, as you heard, uh, Peter is probably the number one generator, Peter and his children, and we were talking about his grandchildren, those of us who teach courses in the areas and have students uh, come to, uh, to, to do papers with us, is the number one generator of scholarship on the subject of food and drug law. At least 83 papers written by his students have been published officially in uh, law journals, a much larger number in an online book uh, that Peter comes. And I just grabbed a couple of the names of the 83 just to show you the incredible diversity of what he teaches us and what we do with what he teaches us. So here's a smattering of them. FDA reform in the European Medicines Evaluation Agency uh, by some young man named Theodore Ruger. Okay. <laughs> the cosmetic drug dilemma, FDA regulation of alpha hydroxy acid. Increasing access to emergency contraceptive pills through state law enabled dependent pharma strips prescribers. Uncapping the bottle, a look inside the history, industry, and regulation of bottled water in the US. And I think this is my favorite, and again, you know, it's true that legal scholarship is not well known for our excellent entitling uh, of papers, and often I think we go for the cheap puns, but this one I think is pretty good. Reading Our Lips, colon, the history of lipstick regulation in the Western seats of power. <laughs> Food, drugs, cosmetics, it's all there. And again, Peter is way ahead of their time. This is something that my center, the Petrie Flom Center, we've copied. We basically give students time, resources, and mentorships to produce real scholarship, because it's our view that you don't need to wait to be a professor in order to be contributing to these scholarly discussions. Instead, our view is that students from day one should be doing this. Okay, uh, the last bucket is Peter as a scholar. We have two of his case book co-authors here. So the true Peter Hutt Bible, the case book, I'm going to let them talk about the joys of working through uh, that thing. It has gone, if you've seen it, you know, they say that you can uh, predict the stock market by the length of skirts of people over time and that there are these correlations. I'd hate to know what the length of the case book, which seems to grow year by year, predicts or doesn't predict, but I guess it predicts it, how much money we're spending on GDP per year in the food and drug law area. But I'm going to talk about his non-casebook scholarship for a moment. So again, one of the things that I love about Peter and his career and that I've tried to emulate, and I think many of us have, is the way he spent time in private practice, in public practice, and in academia, and seems to move between them uh, in a seamless way. Uh, so I thought I'd just go through the Peter bibliography and pick out uh, maybe two papers and tell you a little bit, or three papers, and tell you a little bit of papers he's written outside of the casebook. One article that I love is in 2008, a recent one, in the Administrative Law Review. And what I love about this particular piece by him uh, is the way it shows how deeply he's committed to FDA as a regulatory authority and thinking about the problems of FDA lawyers on a day-to-day -day basis long after leaving his GC role uh, there. So he writes in this article, Science at the Food and Drug Administration today is in a precarious position in terms of both personnel and the money to support them. The agency is barely hanging on by its fingertips. The accumulating unfunded statutory responsibilities imposed on the FDA, the extraordinary advances of scientific discoveries, the complexity of the new products and claims submitted to the FDA for pre-market review and approval, the emergence of challenging safety problems, the globalization of the industries that FDA regulates, 
coupled with chronic underfunding by Congress, have conspired to place demands upon the scientific basis of the agency that far exceeds its capacity to respond. And the rest of the paper, which is a report prepared to talk about FDA readiness, basically documents these things and documents the way in which Congress's attitude towards the FDA and its chronic underfunding of it are jeopardizing things and really predicts many of the things we saw this year and in other years where we see these regulatory failures. Okay. Another paper by Peter, this one is from 1992, the standard of evidence required for pre-market approval under the medical device amendment of 1976. Uh, a mouthful. So again, the question here is how FDA should regulate uh, review uh, of uh, devices vis-a-vis -vis drug regulation. The conclusion of the paper is that the history of the subject is FDA rejected the notion that all devices should be subject to pre-market approval. For those devices for which FDA evaluation on safety and effectiveness prior to marketing was appropriate, Congress concludes that the methods and testing should differ and be less stringent from those designed for drugs. So that's just the conclusion. What's more interesting to me, and I think is more indicative of the way in which Peter approaches a problem, uh, is the way in which we get an exhaustive history from the 1976 amendments, and long before that, right? There is a way in which Peter's uh, scholarship has a certain, for me, thrilling, I think for most of us, thrilling, I don't know everybody in the room, but certainly for those of us on the day, is a thrilling, and now it can be told kind of uh, quality to it, in that we get the official documents, we get the official legislative history, but we also get the skinny. Right? We get the inside discussion of what was really going on. We get to hear what was going on for stakeholders. And for me and for my students, in which the legislative process is often presented in a dry and very orderly way, the picture that P uh, Peter paints in his historical scholarship is anything but that. It is the brass tacks. It is the way decisions really get made. It is the inside of the sausage factory. And it is the way in which those things inform the discussion of future problems. So while we're talking about future problems, I'll just mention two, and maybe Peter can tell us a little bit of his thoughts about this, that we've discussed over the years. One was, this was a time when I was at DOJ and I was litigating uh, this case, but Peter didn't know I was litigating this case. I didn't let know Peter know I was litigating this case. But we talked about it in a very general way, and of course we had very strong opinions, because you know, uh, I won't speak for him, but I'm a very opinionated guy, those of you who know me. <laughs> we're talking about the access to uh, terminally ill patients to have access to experimental drugs before uh, FDA approves it. Things that have gone through phase one of regulatory testing, but not phase two. And you know, at the time, FDA was in the subject of litigation. We had just <laughs> lost uh, the case before a DC Circuit panel. And it looked as though the future of FDA regulation in this area, and maybe all of it was up for grabs. We luckily, oh, I, I think luckily, maybe some people might disagree, and Peter might be one of them, we'll, we'll hear about that. We managed to uh, uh, get victory from the jaws of defeat in that case from the rehearing petition and restore things and avoid uh, a decision that some of FDA's enforcement authority was unconstitutional under substantive due process. But in this conversation, what a remark remarkable, but shouldn't surprise me knowing Peter, is his ability to really see things from all the angles, to sympathize with these parents of terminally ill children and these people who are terminally ill, but also understand what the real deep challenges for FDA's regulatory authority would be had this gone forward. The other episode that's more recent that came to my mind is we've discussed FDA's regulation of stem cell products and autologous stem cell transplants. I'm writing now a book on medical travel, medical tourism, of which one of the chapters is about people who go abroad, mostly to China and Singapore and Russia, for stem cell therapies. But part of this, part of this uh, trend, is the result of FDA's own stance on this and FDA's own saber rattling about the boundaries of its enforcement. So from everything from the 1976 amendment, and we can go way back to the statutes in Virginia about apothecaries uh, during the early days of the American uh, re Republic, uh, really the history, the past, the future, Peter has really covered uh, all of it. So what more is there to say? Uh, I'll end with a bit of verse, since I think that's the right way to end, from Leonard Cohen, another Cohen from Montreal. Uh, Leonard writes, there are some men who should have mountains to bear their names to time. Grave markers are not high enough or green, and sons go far away to lose the fist their father's hand will always seem. Uh, so Peter, I don't know if we're going to have any mountains named after you, but I hope to, that you know that you're creating uh, at least little hills in all of us and all the students you've touched over the year, which I think are now more than 1,000. So it's a real pleasure to get to, to fetch you today. Thank you.
it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Theodore Ruger, another one of those hills or mountains, I'm not exactly sure, but as I do so, I just want to say that it is uh, on a five-point scale that students are invited to evaluate teachers here. And, I have, and when I broke four, I was pretty proud of myself. And then along comes Peter. 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.9, 4.9. I don't know who gave you anything less than five, Peter, but uh, <laughs> you've made it very, very challenging for all of us, even though uh, I also have to say that it's no small uh, measure of your success as a teacher that you've inspired so many people to become teachers. And Ted is one of those, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and former student. He teaches food and drug law. Uh, and he also published his course paper that he did with Peter Hutt on FDA reform and the European Medicine Evaluation Agency, published in the Harvard Law Review in 1995. Thank you, uh, and thank you um, to Petrie Flom and Harvard Law School for hosting this event. It's a, it's a thrill to be back here and, and thinking about one of the most important teachers I had. Um, just as a, an introductory aside, building on what Glenn said, and what uh, Dean Minow said. Um, the, um, the, I did write a paper with Peter. Uh, it was a great experience. I'll say more about that uh, later in my few minutes here. But for the students in the room, uh, Glenn mentioned the lipstick paper. And uh, we often complain that there aren't enough uh, topics left for legal scholars to write about. It looks like there's a wide open topic on lipstick regulation in the eastern seats of power. <laughs> um, so that's, that's good to go. The, the, we've covered the west. but. Um, um, Anybody who spent any time around Peter or thinking about what Peter's career and his work um, it finds uh, that one's senses and intellect are engaged, but there's one sense that kind of, kind of becomes numb, and that's the sense of surprise or awe, which uh, is certainly there initially, but then there's such a baseline of, of energy and achievement and that it's difficult, uh, to, uh, that, that we're, we're difficult to be surprised by anything regarding uh, Peter Barton Hutt. Um, I was surprised in two different ways by the, this uh, very welcome invitation to speak here, uh, and, and in very contradictory ways. And both had to do with this 20-year time frame that we're celebrating. Um, so the first ground for surprise was, you know, my goodness, this is such a long time. Has it really been 20 years? Uh, because I did take the class in 1995, which I guess was the third class you Second. taught here. Second, OK. Um, and in many ways, it's so vivid, it seems like it was yesterday. Um, you could ask me, so I took it, I guess, in my third year. You could ask me um, to describe my entire third year course curriculum, uh, and I hope you don't at the reception after this, because I would forget entire courses I took, I'm sure. I couldn't name the perfectly good courses. But uh, um, whereas with Peter's class, I can remember exact moments in the class, almost down to what was said, you know, things like that, and uh, interactions with Peter, interactions between other students. Um, and I even remember some moments from the class that didn't involve lollipops with worms in them or other things. But I certainly remember the props. Um, and among the, the more, in, uh, um, there's many more uh, endearing and substantial, uh, enduring and substantial things uh, Peter teaches those who study from him. But one of, the, one of them that he teaches those of us who teach in food and drug law is the benefit of bringing the regulated products into class. And such that uh, a few years ago, I found myself sheepishly combing the liquor stores of Philadelphia for a can of Four loco, which is some, you may know, a concoction of caffeine and alcohol, which leads to lots of interesting regulatory issues. And I didn't know if my students, yeah, exactly, a purely, purely an academic uh, prospect. Um, um, the other ground of surprise actually also has to do with the 20 years. And in this sense, I was, I, I'll say, I was surprised that Peter, to, to, to learn that Peter had only been teaching at Harvard Law School for 20 years. Now, only in the context of Peter Barton Hutt could we even use that phrase for a professional achievement. Only 20 years. Um, I've certainly never done anything professionally, or really anything for that matter, for 20 years. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, you know, remarkable when, when put against the long breadth of Peter's career. But more specifically, my surprise gro grows out of this. So this was the second class he taught at Harvard, but both his capabilities in the classroom, his rapport with students, and indeed his reputation among students on the Harvard campus who told me, this is a great class, you got to take this class, would have led me to believe I didn't focus on it at the time. If you would have asked me six months ago, when did Peter start teaching at Harvard, I would have said, oh, maybe say 1985, 
Maybe he'd been there 10 years by the time I'd come in. So that, that was the kind of master teacher he was even when I had him. Um, now, um, in, in deciding what to say in the few minutes I, I have left about Peter, it's, um, it's a challenge given the breadth of, breadth of his career and also the fact that I'm sharing the dais here with other folks who know him well and, and know his work well. Um, Peter, as has been said before in the last few minutes, Peter is, um, has made his mark in multiple, through multiple different dynamics as a teacher, where he's been the leading food and drug law teacher and, and inspired many of us who teach today, as a scholar, where he's been the predominant scholar over the past half century, um, as a lawyer for the FDA, where he shaped that agency's culture uh, in ways that still endure, and as a dean of the private practice of food and drug law in ways that all are important. Um, this calls to mind uh, a kind of juggler keeping multiple balls in the air. Um, even more specifically, an article I read last fall just before the ill-fated New York Marathon, the one that was canceled because of Hurricane Sandy, um, I learned much, I never had thought about this before, but apparently there's an extreme sport called marathon juggling, or juggling while marathoning, where this a <laughs> determined cohort of people um, run 26.2 miles, not enough of a challenge. Um, they do so while juggling three or four balls in the air. Um, and they managed to run faster, certainly, than I could, or than Paul Ryan's real time, um, and uh, all of which is impressive. Um, and which gives, you know, this is now we're talking maybe in the ballpark of, of a Peter Hutt. Um, certainly, he has skillfully kept multiple balls in the air and done so for an extraordinarily ultra marathon period of time, and he's still going, showing no t t t signs of tiring. Um, to touch on some of these roles brief, very briefly, and I know Glenn has said some, uh, Lewis is going to say more, um, just in turn. First, with, for his work within the agency as a, as a lawyer in the FDA in some key formative periods, um, it would be difficult to overstate Peter's role in shaping enduring industry, uh, sorry, F agency practice and procedure in important areas. I think Lewis is going to address this perhaps a bit more. Um, I can note. Um, there's, in, as part of my scholarship, I've been reviewing some interesting oral history of the FDA that's available online, in-depth interviews with people, mostly not, or predominantly non-lawyers, by the way, but the percentage of those interviews, basically anybody who worked at the agency in the 70s into the 80s talks about Peter and his role, and not just the importance, but also the, what, a, what a pleasure it was to work with Peter, how important he was. So he gives a, it gives a vivid sense of his, his role within the agency. Um, within the private practice of, 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 of FDA law in DC, which Peter has done for decades, I interacted as a blip for a few years at Williams and Connolly when I worked with a successor of Peter's, uh, Richard Cooper, on FDA topics and was offered over, over at Covington working uh, in collaboration. Um, he's advised hundreds of attorneys um, but been a leader in the bar there. And more than just quality and, and the duration of his work and the quantity of people he's worked with, I think there's a substantive importance for the lawyering that Peter has done that has become more, more vivid in recent years as we've seen a different style of lawyering in the FDA bar, uh, which is frankly more um, repudiating toward agency authority, even kind of treating the agency as illegitimate in, and, and sometimes with great court success, as we re recently saw, say, in the Second Amendment case, invoking and expanding doctrines like the First Amendment. So um, in, it, Peter's importance uh, is not just in the number of lawyers or his expertise, but actually the, um, the way he practices law on behalf of regulated industry um, is a, is a, uh, connotes an attitude toward agency, which is a constructive attitude and one that uh, sadly is, I think, and Peter might say more about this, is, is not the uniform attitude, certainly today, among the FDA bar. And so there's a real substantive um, importance to Peter's work in the private practice as well. Um, in terms of s scholarship, um, I'm actually not going to say too much about the casebook. I am uh, honored to be a new co-author on the casebook. I will say this. Um, it is by far the most difficult scholarly project I've worked on in my academic career because there was, a, for two reasons. First, there was initial, an in, initial kind of hagiography going on, revising the work of Peter Hutt and Dick Merrill, Louis Grossman. Um, very difficult. Um, so, yeah, well, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, even when that wore off, um, there's so much... There's so much regulatory detail that, to grapple with. And it, it kind of, yet it, it, that again did engage my capacity for amazement and awe to see 
for just how what it takes to be an expert in this field, and I'm certainly not there, but it's uh, it's 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 a pleasure working on that. Um, it, I also want to build on what Glenn said, actually, by mentioning a different article outside the casebook. Um, um, he, going back further, a classic 1972 article, um, The Philosophical uh, Philosophy of Regulation Under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which has been republished and is kind of a classic in the field. And here, Peter's contribution um, is not primarily descriptive or historical, it's theoretical. It's in casting this statute, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, as quasi constitutional. Okay, so, and in ways that I'll address in, in a minute that actually align quite well with current statutory interpretation scholarship and the important work being done at Harvard Law School when Peter was here by Hart and Sachs in the 1950s. Um, so Peter wrote in 1972, the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act must be regarded as a constitution. It establishes a set of fundamental objectives, safe, effective, wholesome, and truthfully label, labeled products without attempting to specify every such detail of regulation. Um, now this calls to mind, and it should, I suppose, the word, words of Chief Justice John Marshall, who of course also said um, about the Constitution itself, but made the point, we should never forget it's a Constitution we are expounding. And both for Peter and for Chief Justice Marshall, um, that statement, that notion of quasi, of, 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 that, that there's a sp specific kind of document we're interpreting, carries with it important interpretive implications that Peter um, brought out in specific contexts when he working within the agency and a, as an attorney, and that, um, that kind of links Peter's work and the contributions he's made over his career to current debates and, and as well as past debates in statutory interpretation and constitutional interpretive theory, okay? We hear about uh, textualism, kind of thinking about the text in a somewhat disembodied um, plain, plain meaning format, and certainly that's not Peter's interpretive method. Uh, we also hear, uh, and, and perhaps sometimes, perhaps too often, the uh, scholars who reject textualism are perhaps too quick to embrace a, a kind of repudiation of the text altogether and a more institutional, purely institutional or purely political analysis. Um, Peter's framework la laid out in that piece and others is a middle ground between the two. Um, recognizing that text alone is insufficient without institutional explication, but also recognizing that the words of the statute do mean something. It's perhaps testament to the uh, nuanced and principled middle ground that Peter has laid out that he's been attacked over the decades from both directions, as you well know, accused of rewriting the statute, ignoring the statute, but then recently by the eminent political scientist here at Harvard, Dan Carpenter, in an otherwise excellent book, um, who calls Peter to, uh, who describes Peter's mode as legalistic or legalism, which I think is too thin. A dis <laughs> well, I think, uh, I, not an insult, but I also think too thin a description of, of the rich role that uh, a combination of text, institutional politics, uh, real world consequences plays in, in Peter's theory. And as such, it's evocative, both um, going forwards and back, and I'll, I'll wrap up soon, it's both evocative of the kind of some of the most important current work on statutes, and I'm thinking primarily but not exclusively of Bill Eskridge and John Fairjohn's book called Republic of Statutes, which essentially identifies a number of statutes that they denominate as quasi-constitutional, not the FDCA, they leave that realm to Peter, but, uh, but, their, but their interpretive uh, suggestion is very similar to what Peter's entire career has kind of embodied. Looking back, um, this resonates with the, the legal process school of Professors Hart and Sachs, um, were promulgating in the 1950s when you were here, and indeed, I, I don't know if you had their course, but certainly your work, um, your your work um, reminds your work is in that intellectual tradition and kind of serves as a great bridge to that. Um, so, just wrapping up in the interest of time, I, I haven't addressed, um, in, indeed, of course, back to the beginning, the first interaction I had with you as a as a master teacher in ways that I'll um, long remember. I remember 18 years ago vividly. I do my best, though fall short of the standard, to embody it in my own interactions with students. Um, and we can measure, Glenn has talked, we can measure your impact through the sheer number of students you've advised, the sheer number of papers, the progeny in, in the bar and, and academia, and indeed that progeny is now having our own progeny. One of my best FDA students, Holly Fernandez Lynch, is here. Um, <laughs> And, um, and so I guess, um, I guess in a sense, a, a scholarly grandchild of, of yours, now <laughs> helping, helping to run uh, the Petrie Flom Center. I guess that, Holly, I guess Glenn is then your uncle in Peter Hutt familiar <laughs> terms. Uh, so 
um, but it's a, it's a big family and growing. Um, and, um, and indeed, it's that, it's that notion, the notion of connectedness with students. I mean, I do remember the lollipops with worms, but even more importantly, I remember the time spent talking with you in class, after class, over dinner, and that's, uh, that's, that's your influence really resonates through that, even today. So. First of all, there are seats in the front for people who are willing to sit closer to Peter. Um, <laughs> Secondly, uh, actually, Ted did something that I wanted to emphasize too, so I'm just going to pause for a moment and say it. There is a world, uh, a universe, in the food and drug world that Peter inhabits. And it's all of law and all of norms. And it's constitutional, metaphorically, um, statutory interpretation, regulatory, of course, but also the notion of criminal law, the notion of economic incentives, the notion of how to promote innovation, the notion of how to protect the vulnerable. Uh, there's every aspect of law. In, and, and so I think that it's not uh, at all by accident uh, that you emphasize the constitutional dimension of, his, of, of Peter's early work. I think that it's also a kind of uh, invitation, and I say this directly to the students, if you're looking for a career where you can do all of law, you don't want to specialize. This is a great one. Um, but maybe you'll say some more about that later. Uh, some people who know Peter really well would be people who have worked alongside in the casebook, and that would be Ted and Lewis, but also who've seen him in practice, and that is Lewis. So I want to say that Professor Grossman, as professor of law of American University, Washington College of Law, where he teaches food and drug law, didn't have the a benefit of having Peter as a teacher. He came here before Peter was teaching. I think that we ended up recruiting Peter because you insisted, or something like that. But, um, but you then did have the chance to work with him and, I guess, be a student and a teacher of his in some way, as, as uh, in your work as count, of counsel at Covington and Burling, and then as collaborator on the, um, the Bible, otherwise known as the casebook, uh, now uh, entering into its fourth edition. So, Lewis. Thank you very much. It's a, a true honor to be here to um, celebrate the career of somebody who, in terms of shaping my professional life, is certainly by far the most important influence on me. I simply would not have chosen or succeeded at my career path if I hadn't had the good fortune of meeting Peter Hutt. As Dean Minow said, I was not a student of his, at least in the formal sense here. The Harvard Law School I went to was, uh, I know you're going to be surprised that I'm actually older than these two guys, but, but, but I am. Uh, it was a very different Harvard Law School. And in fact, one reflection of that is I took civil procedure from Al Sachs. It was that long ago. It was a Harvard Law School of 150 person sections, two fewer major buildings. Instead of the Casperson Student Center, we had the ugly Formica vinyl linoleum and God knows what else hark um, with two clanging pinball machines, if you remember that. Um, and most importantly, for our purposes today, Harvard had no Peter Hutt and no food and drug law. When I left HLS, I don't think I was even aware of food and drug law as a field of study or a field of practice. Indeed, I was only dimly aware of administrative practice as an alternative to litigation or transactional work or maybe tax or trust in estates. Um, I am now a uh, huge celebrator of administrative practice as something students should, should consider going into. So how did I have the good fortune to meet Peter? Well. I got a PhD in history after, after law school, which will become relevant again in a moment. Um, and then I moved to DC to clerk on the uh, DC circuit. And I wasn't planning on staying in DC, but um, the woman who is now my wife, uh, Lisa, um, and I got engaged. Um, and I realized I actually was going to stay in DC and had to earn a living. Um, so, one of, I was clerking for Judge Mikva, and clerking uh, for another judge on, on the DC circuit was none other than uh, Sarah Hutt, uh, Peter's uh, daughter, who I first met in 1982 in the Durfee Sweet Shop uh, on old <laughs> campus at Yale. 
Um, and, and Sarah said, you should talk to my father. He has a really fascinating practice. Um, and so I did, and I had lunch with Peter Hutt. From the moment I met Peter, I was captivated by him and by his field. What was it about this man that was so captivating? Well, by the end of this introductory one-hour lunch, three things about Peter were already apparent to me. First, he is incredibly generous. In time, this generosity would ripen into a related but different attribute, an extraordinary loyalty that he shows to his colleagues and former students. Second, Peter loves his career more than anyone I've ever met. And I'm not saying that just for purposes of the fest trip today. It's true. He really loves his career more than any person I've ever met. And it was actually wonderful as I entered practice to meet this man because there was a lot of grumbling about how awful practice is and uh, what a grind it is and how boring it is and you're a paper pusher and useless. And meanwhile, Peter was not only grandly influential, but also just bubbling over with joy every day uh, he went to work. Third thing I learned from this lunch, uh, Peter and I were in certain respects soulmates. What we shared and share most of all was a voracious curiosity and a consequent refusal to let ourselves be intellectually narrowed. We both share a love of history as well as an engagement with the present. And Peter, I think, appreciates the way no practitioner in the country would, no other practitioner. For example, my recent work on medical freedom is reflected through the 19th century Thompsonian. Uh, and he doesn't say, uh-huh, 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 yeah. He, 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 uh, he loves that stuff. Um, so second, um, we share, uh, so in terms of this voracious curiosity, when we, our love of food and drug law is in part the fact that food and drug law embraces everything from the simplest and silliest cosmetic or food product hanging at the front counter of CVS to the highest tech medical devices and drugs and, and biotechnology products, and we love it all. And a lot of people go into food and drug thinking they want to be the high-tech, you know, uh, um, scientific thinkers of the future, and uh, I think Peter and I have both uh, converted a bunch of them to supermarket lawyers, basically, <laughs> uh, realizing that, that, is, that there is true joy in that, too. Third, we share a true enthusiasm about uh, wrestling with both the regulatory details of the law and broad policy issues. And uh, we, we deal with the entire range of this with joy and with pleasure. Now, I, I have to correct something a little bit um, about what, what Dean Minow said. Um, she talked about Peter uh, as a generalist within law. Um, I, I will say with some sadness that Peter is one of the last great generalists within the food and drug field. By the time I arrived on the scene, that model of practice was already disappearing. I enjoyed practicing at Covington and Burling so much that I considered abandoning my plans to go into academia and to stay as a practicing lawyer. But I had a meeting and, uh, with, with partners within the food and drug group, not Peter, and they were, they were very uh, um, enthusiastic and promising about my, my future at the firm. But it became clear in the course of the, that meeting that what I would be if I stayed at, at Covington and Burling was a food lawyer. Now, I love food law. Um, it, it's a fascinating field. But I had trouble choosing between medical school and law school. And then when I got to law school, I had trouble choosing between you know, this and that, and history and past, uh, present, and so forth. So um, I realized that if I want to be a generalist, uh, it's not going to really be possible the way it used to be. Um, in, in legal practice. So to academia I went, one of the last refuges for aspiring generalists in our increasingly specialized profession. I want to say a few words about Peter's importance to the field. Um, despite his many decades as the giant of private food and drug practice, I think that the aspect of his career he takes the most pride in, and he can correct me in his comments, um, other than perhaps his teaching of this class for 20 years, is his service as FDA chief counsel in the 1970s. In that position, he was an extraordinarily influential figure, not only in food and drug law, but administrative law generally. 
By the way, if any of you ever um, have the good fortune to practice with Peter, a very common exchange will be uh, you cite a statutory section and he says, I wrote that legislation. <laughs> then you mention a section from the CFR and he says, I wrote that regulation. Um, so, I mean, so the influence is, is very solid and concrete in that way, but it, it's also uh, theory through practice, as, as Ted was saying. And I'm not gonna talk about the Food and Drug Act as constitution because Ted has already alluded to that. I'm gonna talk about another revolutionary thing that Peter Hutt did. And it's policy making through rulemaking. Before the early 1970s, Agencies generally developed their policy in a piecemeal way through specific enforcement actions or specific uh, adjudications. There was rulemaking, but most of the rulemaking was formal rulemaking, a very involved, complicated process. Some of you may have heard of the peanut butter rulemaking where Skippy, Peter Pan, and Jif fought for 10 years uh, in a cage match about how much peanut product peanut butter had to have to be called peanut butter. Peter looked at a section of the Food and Drug Act, section 701A, 701A, and what it says is this. The authority to promulgate regulations for the efficient enforcement of the act is hereby vested in the secretary. Nobody had really paid that much attention to that provision, which by the way has parallel provisions in many other organic statutes of agencies. To the degree it was used, it tended to be used to issue procedural rules and, and things like that. Peter realized that he could use this provision to justify the issuance of very, very important substantive rules that would, um, that would govern important substantive issues in a more general, forward-looking uh, way than the case-by-case -case adjudication uh, that had occurred before then. And this is now although with the ossification of rulemaking, it's, it's harder and harder to do administrative notice and comment rulemaking. Uh, although it's you know, largely in the guise of guidances now, it is still the way that law is done, and Peter is largely responsible for that. He was also, by the way, uh, responsible for formalizing and rationalizing agency procedure. A lot of the foundational procedural regulations of the Food and Drug Administration, for example, the uh, the Freedom of Information Procedures, written by Peter Hutt. So in closing, Peter has, I think, achieved every one of his professional goals, with the exception of one ambition that, um, I don't want to rain on the parade, but it's an ambition that I think remains only partially fulfilled. I know that Peter would love to see food and drug law become a standard, important subject in the American law school curriculum and in legal scholarship. Harvard with Peter Hutt gives you a sort of false sense of the place of food and drug law within legal academia. The subject is taught at many law schools, but despite us, not typically by tenure or tenure track professors. Relevant articles appear in the legal literature, but food and drug law is somehow not yet treated as a coherent field of scholarship. One might ask, well, why would any law school in the country feel it had a hole in its faculty if it did not have an environmental law professor, but doesn't feel it has a hole if it doesn't have a food and drug law pr professor? After all, the Food and Drug Administration regulates about 25 cents of every consumer dollar um, spent in this country. I don't know how that number is affected by a story I saw in the New York Times this morning uh, saying that FDA is now regulating human feces as a drug. I don't know <laughs> what market share that represents. But, but, but anyhow, in, in his Harvard Law School class, Peter has trained an entire generation of potential food and drug law professors, many of whom have written truly brilliant scholarship in the field in conjunction with his class. This pool of extraordinary talent is slowly, but too slowly, infiltrating its way into academia. So I say to the students out there in the room, go forth and conquer academia and complete Peter's vision. And if you do so, I have a casebook that you're definitely going to want to read. As promised, Peter, rebuttal. 
Well, before I give my own reflections on the last 20 years, I first want to thank some people here who are with us who made all of this possible. Glenn, it was your idea to have this event, and I just want to thank you for your extraordinary thoughtfulness, and I really uh, appreciate it. Martha, you supported it from the beginning, and indeed, you have been one of the strongest supporters of the course. So, I, well, <laughs> I love this course too, as we'll come to that. Ted and Lewis, you should be home working on the casebook. <laughs> But thank you for coming and for your remarks. And I wouldn't leave out you, Holly, and Catherine Paris, and the work you've done to make this happen, because you've done the heavy lifting, and I, uh, I very much appreciate that. I also want to thank my law firm. There aren't a lot of law firms that would let a partner go wander off every January to Boston wondering where he was and what he was doing and whether he would ever come back. But they did it with complete understanding and encouragement for all 20 years. One of Covington's great unique strengths throughout its 90-year history has been its emphasis on scholarship and on teaching. And I don't think even you may know this, Martha, here are the people who learned food and drug law at Covington and Burling and came to Harvard Law School to teach but never taught food and drug law. Al Sachs, Abe Shays, Roger Fisher, David Shapiro, Richard Stewart. Now, that is remarkable. And they all worked with Tommy Austin, who was my mentor as well. It is a remarkable. The person who had the greatest influence on me here, Ted, was Al Sachs. He taught not only the legal process, I took every, and civil procedure too, I took every course he taught at the law school because just listening to him and how he analyzed issues was incredible. Moreover, I only learned years later that I put two and two together. One of his important examples in the legal process casebook that was never a casebook until he was deceased um, was a food and drug law example that you probably remember. So all of this influence had a tremendous impact on me. But when none of them would teach here, I had to come back and teach. I also want to make a comment upon one person who is not with us, my collaborator of 45 plus years, Richard Merrill. Dick Merrill, I first met at Covington. He followed me as chief counsel of FDA. We wrote the original casebook and the second edition together. He is unfortunately suffering from Parkinson's disease, or he would be here. But I could not fail to mention Dick and the influence that he has had on me. Now I'm going to do something. I want to, I want to reflect on some things. But they're all going to reflect not on the state of food and drug law, but on the teaching of food and drug law and what I have tried to do. Now, you quoted from my first day, Glenn. I'm going to quote from my first day of teaching because my older daughter, Kathy, who is seated, seated right here, when I first came up to prepare a course that I had never taught before uh, in a complete you know, sense of a 45-hour course, uh, I, I closeted myself between Christmas and New Year's. Incidentally, the school's due diligence, Martha, ought to be improved. No one asked me if I had ever taught the course before. <laughs> they saw the casebook and they just assumed that. So I came up here and, and thought it up in a week, the whole course. 
And the first day, January 3, 1994, I, I have my, uh, my full journal in front of you here that I prepared that first year. It was Kathy who made me do it. She called me every night and asked me if I had written that down. But I, the first day I laid out five principles. And I, I'm going to read to you uh, what I decided to do because it hasn't changed, not a bit, in 20 years. And I'm quoting. I told the class that I came back to Harvard Law School for this winter term with several objectives firmly in mind. First, I wanted to bring administrative law alive. It can be deadly dull when taught to law students, but, quote, real administrative law, quote, is an extraordinarily interesting and absorbing field of practice. Let me just add to that. I use the phrase real administrative law all the time. It's what real practitioners do. I once gave a speech, I was almost thrown out, but to the, uh, uh, Association of Administrative Law Professors, and I started out by saying, either you don't teach administrative law or I don't practice administrative law <laughs> because what you and I do have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Second, I'm going back to quoting Second, I wanted to convey the joy and excitement of food and drug law as one example of administrative law. It represents the cutting edge of modern public policy and involves issues that have a vital impact on our future. Certainly, it's even more true today than it was on January 3, 1994. Third, I wanted the students to understand just how much fun it can be to practice law. And I agree with the comments earlier. Law students get out of law school having a terrible image of their future. And I, I'll have to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to continue on. Contrary to popular notions, law remains one of the most exciting and interesting occupations that one can imagine. There is simply not enough time in the day for me to do all the challenging things in which I have an opportunity to participate. Fourth, I wanted everyone there to appreciate that they have the opportunity ahead of them to make major contributions to society and thus to look forward to becoming a lawyer on graduation. Lawyers have an unlimited opportunity to make a, a substantial impact on virtually every important aspect of national policy. And I emphasize this, which surprised many people in my class that I would say this. I finished just one person above the middle of my class at the law school. I'd like to make a footnote. I've since recalculated. I was two people above the middle. <laughs> That's always made me feel better. And, and besides, it's better than being one person below the middle of the class. Okay. But I've certainly been able during my career to participate in important public policy issues in a wide variety of ways. Lawyers are free to choose their own destiny. If I can do what I have done, every person in the class certainly can do as well, if not much better. We all have enormous freedom to choose our careers and what we accomplish is limited only by our own personal decisions. Fifth and finally, I had no interest in trying to convince any student in the class to become a food and drug lawyer, but I did want to teach the law and policy relating to food and drugs. We would focus on the statutory standard, how FDA implements it, the attitudes and assumptions brought to important issues by FDA, what the agency does in the face of uncertainty, which we discussed in class today, 
whether the agencies applies consistent policy standards and what impact, good or bad, it has on the daily lives of all of us. Now that's what I wrote 20 years ago. That's what I said 20 years ago. I wouldn't change a word of it today and the students from my course in 2013, see did I see many of you, will verify that that's what I said the first day this term. I have repeated these objectives on the first day and then on the last day of every course in these 20 years. I want students to leave here with the desire to find the same passion in their lives that I have found in food and drug law in my life. I don't care whether they're tax lawyers, corporate lawyers, public service lawyers, but they ought to go out there prepared to find what will drive them the way Lewis and I are driven in our lives. My focus then, and for all 20 years, was on my connecting with the students and their connecting with each other. And I emphasize the latter because Harvard Law School is a very big institution. And certainly in my own experience, it can be a very isolating place. It's not easy for students to connect. To bring all of us together, I undertook a number of procedures. Some have been mentioned. First, I did obtain everybody's curriculum vitae, and to this day, I have lots of fun saying things about the students that they would never bring out in, in class. No one at Harvard Law School would say, well, I have a PhD in electrical engineering. But if I bring it out, then that student's comments take extra value and it connects that student with other people in the course. I hand letter every year a name card for every student. And Martha, the thing that has surprised me is that my hand lettering it means more to the students than anything else. It shows an interest in the students and makes a connection that otherwise would not be made. Fortunately, my mother taught me good lettering. <laughs> and I, I love to mention my mother, who is now 107 years old, and who came to the course, actually, when she was about 100, I think, the, uh, when she came to the course. She came to the course, I think, to make sure I actually was teaching at Harvard <laughs> Law School. <laughs> and that I hadn't made it up. <laughs> I did ask her two questions, and she boomed out her answers with no problem at all. And she came to the beer party that <laughs> night. I do have lunch and dinner with any student or any group of students who wish to do so. It's not for the purpose of discussing fine issues of food and drug law. It's for connecting. It's for seeing what their interests are and seeing how I can help them achieve those interests in the future. We have two pizza and beer parties. They were originally held in the worst dump in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> Unfortunately, that dump got so bad it went out of business. So they're now in slightly more respectable places, but they are good fun. Our second one, actually they were always on Thursday nights, but I decided we couldn't have one after this event. <laughs> My office hours are nine hours a day, seven days a week, from two in the afternoon to 11 at night. I want to make sure that if anybody wants to talk to me, there's no excuse that they can't find time. And I use those, again, to try to think ahead to the future for when, for example, I'm going to be writing letters of recommendation. 
I can write a letter of recommendation to a judge that will describe what I'll come to in a moment, the debate topic, I'll be able to refer to my notes as to what was said, it will describe our lunch conversation, it will describe the interactions at social events, so much so that a few judges call me and say, wait a minute, did you make all this up? You're at Harvard Law School, you couldn't know this person. <laughs> and the fact is I do, and it's important if you're going to make an impact of that kind. And my favorite, I have a collection of school ties. And I wear a different tie every day for an undergraduate institution represented in the class. I'm afraid now I've run out of time to do that, so I now have to change my tie halfway through the three hour period <laughs> to work in all the ties. And I do have to point out, my tie right now is the Harvard Law School tie that was given to me by my first class. And I'm very proud of this tie. Now what I do in the classroom is again designed to do two things. To bring the students together, to put the issues not in an ideological context, but rather in a neutral context where you see both sides of the issues so that there's no feeling that there is a politically correct and incorrect way of looking at what can be very emotional issues. That's why I came up with the debate system. And I cannot understand, Glenn, why more people don't use that system in a lot of different contexts. Among other things, in my three years at Harvard Law School, Martha, yours may have been different. I never had an opportunity to stand up in front of a class, prepared, and be able to show that I could think through an issue logically and acquit myself very well. This debate system allows the students to do exactly that. And when they leave the classroom, they leave proud of themselves. They've done a good job. And they know they've done a good job in front of their classmates. And it is just a fabulous feeling. Then there ought to be more opportunities for that kind of participation. We then engage in Socratic discussion, and anything goes. And let me tell you, anything does go. We have some of the greatest discussion you can possibly imagine. With no sense of, the, of anyone holding back, everyone really states their opinion and disagrees with each other. Because the way I have set it up, after the debates, it isn't me who asks the students debaters the questions, it's their fellow students. And therefore, everyone has a good time to do, it, to do that. Finally, I do require a paper, and I, the students will remember this. I say at the beginning of every year, you invest yourself in a paper. You don't invest yourself in an exam question. And I point out that I can remember every paper I have ever read, written, rather. I cannot remember a single exam question in my entire life that I ever wrote. Indeed, I said this year, I couldn't remember an exam question one, one hour after I wrote <laughs> the answer to that question. And I must admit, I'm pleased that eight to nine percent of those papers do get published. I point out to students, this is the easiest way you'll ever have to publish a paper. You've got to write it anyway, for heaven's sake. All you have to do is do a little additional work and you will get it published. Now, all of this, I think, has succeeded. But I want to read to you again one more excerpt from my journal from the day after the last day of classes, namely January 27, 
1994. I was not certain that I adequately conveyed to the students the depth of my affection for the entire class. Without any question during the short period of three weeks, I became very attached to my students, more so than I had anticipated would occur. Perhaps it was because this was my first class ever, but I doubt it. Rather, it was because of the style of the class, free and open discussion, and the genuine intimacy that developed as a result of the way that all of us approached it. A number of students actually asked me during our meals together how it had all occurred. A number of students, I'm sorry, one by one, they began to feel not just that they were taking a course, but they were part of an active discussion group among close friends. None could remember the moment that it occurred, or how it occurred, or what I had done to make it happen. I will confess that I do not know how it happened either nor am I certain that it is reproducible, although I believe that it is. It is an attitude and an approach, not a system or a formula. Perhaps attitude is most important at all, of all these elements. I really meant all the things I said the first and last day of class. And I think that everything I did simply reinforced what I said. Each year, I put everything I have into this course. I will confess that. And I come back to Washington, DC, as I wrote you once, exhilarated and exhausted. It's a lot of work. But I will tell you, it is always the best month of the year, and I hope that will continue, Martha, for some years to come. Thank you. Uh, a, a very difficult act to follow, and therefore the only way to really best honor Peter beyond this event itself, for which I thank the entire panel, I thank you all for being here, is to have a little bit of time for discussion. Because that is your emblem, that is what you do so beautifully. I do want to say what I allowed, what I just said to you, which is we hope you will continue to come here as long as you're willing, because the title of this event is 20 Years So Far. <laughs> All right, I I'm gonna ask a question, but I would really most want to have others here ask questions or, or make comments. And the question that I wanna ask is what you foresee, particularly with regard to food and food regulation, and do you see students having more interest in that, and do you see issues of a sort that we haven't had before? And I say this because I see the growth of student interest. I see in life, in the world, the issues about what's organic, what's local, what's sustainable. And, and will this be regulated the same way that food additives have been regulated? What is the future of food law? Food law is a much bigger subject than just FDA regulation of food. I wish I had the time and energy to investigate all the different areas. Think of agricultural policy in our country. That's food policy. Think of meat and poultry regulated by, after all, USDA because of a historical accident in 1883 whereby meat and poultry were separated in USDA from the rest of the food supply. Think of all of the issues 
of the congressional dealing with food, just the, just the way Congress sets itself up and the impact of that. The fact that even though FDA was separated from agriculture in, in 1939, the Agriculture Appropriations Committee still won't give it up. They still control FDA appropriations. There is such a broad area of scholarship that I can barely begin to describe it. And this is something that I think a food law society would be enormously important in beginning exploration and getting other scholars to come here and to uh, give courses in those areas, Martha. Thank you. What do we do? Since I have the glasses, I think we'll do Sally Jesse Raphael style, and I'll take <laughs> some questions from the uh, audience. Does anybody want to make a comment or a question? Don't be shy. Peter may call on you if you don't. Nobody wants a question? <laughs> no one? anymore? I'll tell you what the problem is. I started food and drug law because of Harvard Law School. I will explain exactly what happened. Uh, in 1959, now that's 54 years ago now, so that I grew up with it. When I started practicing food and drug law, it was all food law because it wasn't until the 1962 drug amendments, the thalidomide amendments, that drugs were of any importance whatever in FDA. So if you grow up with the entire body of law and the development of the <laughs> law, you can cover it. And, of course, that means you can teach it. Now, if you were to start today, and we'll just take drugs, which is just massively exploded in terms of complexity. There are now 3,000 guidance emanating from FDA as to how you regulate not just drugs broadly, but individual categories of drugs. People today coming out of law school are forced perhaps to even decide, should I get into the field of over-the-counter drugs or prescription drugs because they are so complex. So, and, and to try to add on medical devices on top of that and really understand it, Martha, is very difficult. So it is very hard to be a generalist. I may be the last one. Peter, l let me ask a question, then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it back out. Can I get you to say something about the first term of the Obama administration and the relationship, the very public relationship between FDA uh, and the White House? I mean, this is, to me, seemed a kind of un uh, a publicly unprecedented form of overruling. Is it just that, you know, this always happened, but this is the first time we saw it in the public. Do you think something has changed in the relationship between the White House and FDA? Is this a, a one-off because of a very sensitive topic? So whether or whether you see this as a more permanent change? This is not a permanent change. Uh, this is the first time that the White House gave advice, I use that in a broad sense of the word advice, to FDA publicly. Oh, I'm sorry. On yes, on Plan B, the uh, morning after pill, the question was: Should it be allowed over the counter for a younger age group than it originally was? And not only was um, the the FDA commissioner Peggy Hamburg overruled by the Secretary of HHS, but this voice boomed out from Colorado saying, I don't want my two daughters to have this drug available. It happened to be the President of the United States who made that statement. So it was a very public uh, event. The White House constantly gives FDA advice. OMB constantly gives FDA advice. It was the public nature of that 
that was so unusual. For example, FDA wanted to ban all raw milk. The White House said no. Nobody knew the White House said no until it came out in a deposition in a court case. Yes, um, the FDA graphic images with tobacco, many First, right, uh, first Amendment uh, scholars feel that this compelled speech goes far beyond any kind of compelled speech previously allowed uh, under the uh, First Amendment. Um, and it's going to go before the United States Supreme Court. I think they've accepted this. Do you think the FDA is exceeding its authority? The first important First Amendment case from an FDA standpoint was in 1999. And, and let me explain exactly what the history is and where it's going now. The first clear Supreme Court decision saying that the First Amendment applied not only to political speech, but to commercial speech was the Virginia Board of Pharmacy case in 1976, 72. 76, I think. <laughs> yes, and, and I was always glad it was 1976. Yeah, it was. I, I was glad it was 1976 because I left the agency in 1975, and I didn't have to deal with it. <laughs> That's why I remember the year, Louis. <laughs> FDA took the position, and I'm not kidding, they took the position the First Amendment did not apply to FDA because FDA dealt with, with, with human safety in the most direct way of, of, you know, you can't live without eating and many people can't live without drugs. And therefore, this took the agency above the First Amendment. That lasted until the 1990s. And it was actually, there were, were some isolated district court decisions, but it was the DC Circuit in Pearson v. Shalala in 1999, in which the court said unequivocally, and with both liberal and conservative judges, the First Amendment applies, FDA, and you better shape up. That was a bombshell, and I, I said then, and I say now, it was the single most important court case in a hundred years, because FDA only regulates two things. They regulate products or substances, sort of physical things, and they regulate words. Half of what they do is regulating words. And here, for the first time, they are confronting the First Amendment right to free commercial speech. I have no idea how that case will come out. But there, we are going to see, and, and I'd like my two real scholars here to my right, to talk about what they see as the future of the First Amendment. Is this a debate format? or? <laughs> 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 I think, well, I actually think we feel the same way about it. We've talked about it a bit, but we have seen, not just in the FDA context, but in, in kind of cognate uh, regulatory context, an expansion. I mean, we have a bigger First Amendment than we did five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And so this is uh, certainly from the Supreme Court and then circuit judges who are influenced by the cues from this court. Um, this is kind of the new repository for expanding rights, one perhaps the favorite one for the, the Roberts and late Rehnquist court, and you know it's a different kind of rights. It's rights that inhere in corporations vis-a-vis uh, -vis their political activity or their uh, promotional activity, et cetera. Um, it, it is a huge issue for the FDA um, and other kind of health regulatory agencies. I think the, the open question, and I too am, don't uh, I hesitate to make any clear predictions because there is clearly it, um, embodied in the initial kind of uh, categorical response that FDA had, namely health regulation is different and thus should not be. Now clearly that extreme view that the early FDA posed is not carrying the day, but um, I think even for many of the justices, there may come a point where 
uh, hindering the public health pr protecting function of agencies like the FDA will lead them to cease their expansion of the First Amendment, but I guess we haven't, we certainly haven't seen that limitation yet from them. Yeah, I told a, an audience at the Food and Drug Law Institute last year that it is impossible to be a complete food and drug lawyer now without also being a First Amendment lawyer, or at least a commercial speech lawyer. Um, the case that remains unmentioned, and is perhaps the most dramatic of all, is a case from the Second Circuit recently decided called Coronia, where a, um, a sales representative for a pharmaceutical company was marketing, ex expressly marketing a drug for off-label uses. Um, he was prosecuted, and his defense was a First Amendment defense, basically saying that he has a commercial free speech right to talk about these off-label uses, and he won in the Second Circuit. And let me add that this is not just the Clarence Thomases of the world who are writing these decisions. Um, Denny Chin um, wrote that decision. And so it really has the possibility of revolutionizing food and drug regulation. As Peter said, half of food and drug regulation is regulation of words. I imagine that the Supreme Court will tap on the brakes at some point. I just don't know exactly when it is. Um, but it'll be interesting to see whether they allow basically the whole system of pre-market approval of new uses of drugs to unravel, or whether maybe this is the time they, they tap on the brakes. I just want to say one word on the coronia. I have, I have said that if FDA is smart, they don't want to take that case to the Supreme Court. I wouldn't risk what the Supreme Court might say at this stage of the game. I would just take my uh, loss and, and bury it somewhere. <laughs> we have time for one more. There was a question over here, and then one more quick answer, and then we'll have reception, the most important part. Did you want to say, did you have a question I, before? I'm sorry, I was back here. Hi, I had a comment and a question. Um, as Peter knows, I was actually a senior regular at FDA, and Plan B was one of my products. Uh, I can assure you there was enormous pressure from the White House uh, for years on that product. Margaret Hamburg just got dressed down in public and that was odd and bizarre and all sorts, particularly I'm sure from her point of view, but this happens all the time. The agency is an inherently political organization. It always has been. Um, I actually had two questions, one back to food. I wanted to know if you thought food should be split off from the agency since the skill set for the medical officers is so different than it is for devices and vaccines and drugs and it's so expansive and they have so many problems. Maybe administratively it might function better as its own entity. And then the second thing, obviously, is I'd like you to comment on the compounding debacle going on here. You came out very publicly on day one uh, against the position statement that came from the FDA counsel's office, and I'd like you to comment on how you think the agency has handled that so far and what you would do differently. Well, as always, I'll start with history. The reason food and drug has been conjoined since ancient times in all regulatory statutes is because until 1850, all drugs were basically herbs and spices and food. It was all plant, animal, and mineral substances. Now, today, I think it would be a disaster to break FDA up because there's such a thin dividing line among these various categories. If you, if you market a food product and say it's going to have an impact on a disease, that food is regulated as a drug. And if you had two or three regulatory agencies fighting over these boundaries, it would be terrible. Finally, you'd have to have two or three different inspectors at the border and two or three different inspectors in each factory. So I see no reason to, to break things up. Not to mention our casebook. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> well, that, that ends that dispute. <laughs> Now, as far as NECC and what they did, FDA has had a policy statement since 1992 
saying if you compounded large quantities, you were a, quote, drug manufacturer, quote, and subject to all the new drug application and GMP and other requirements. Moreover, in the 19, I'm sorry, 2006 warning letter that the agency sent to the compounder, they said, we have all the legal authority we need. And then when the problem occurred, they said, oh, we don't think we have the legal authority. I think it was absurd and it was, frankly, FDA is always having trouble admitting it's wrong when it, when it, it is wrong. And they would have been better off, what I said was, it was a matter of priorities and resources. They made a mistake. But it's an understandable mistake because they have so much responsibility for which they do not have adequate appropriations. And that was what the problem was. Great. Well, I wanted to. Go ahead. No, 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 no. <laughs> Dean prerogative over professorial <laughs> prerogative. <laughs> Well, there have been many words spoken here, and none of them regulated. Um, I do think that the most important ones that have been spoken include, uh, so far, uh, but two that haven't been uh, said, which are thank you. And uh, it is with the deepest and most emphatic thanks that we celebrate you, Peter Hutt. Um, and, uh, and then two more words, which are food, drink, which is next. <laughs> thank you very much, Peter, and thank you to you too and to the dean. <laughs>